Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Today we talk about direct and indirect effects. And this is basically about a paper from Julia Pearl. Um, oh, do I have the paper open? Maybe I have it even open. Uh, where do we have it? Window. Causality. Pearl. There it is. Oh. Okay. So that is a conference paper. And again, uh, that's from a certain conference called UAI, which stands for Uncertainty in Artificial Intelligence, and it's already older from 2001. So that is, th this is one of some of the venues where Julia Pearl and his colleagues published a lot of these things. And it's an uncertainty in AI, so the uncertainty refers to that they like a lot Bayesian networks and relational Bayesian learning, and these kind of areas are common in, at the UAI, but also many other topics. But it, I think it's not a classical machine learning conference, this UAI, but it's more like an AI conference. So in, in this paper, um, he talks about direct and indirect effects. Um, let me very briefly introduce you to that one. So uh, suppose we have a very simple graphical structure, x, y, and z, like this. So x is the so-called control variable, so whether a person was treated or not. Y is response variable, so whether you got cured or not, and Z is some intermediate variable. And then there are these noise variables which are not shown here to have a complete structural causal model. Um, and a typical example is like in the medical domain, but it could be also something else. There's this sex discrimination in hiring domain, which will be an example we'll look at a couple of times. So where X is the gender, or it could be also the race, or some variable that you actually don't want to use, Y is whether you get hired by a company or not, and Z are your qualifications. And then, of course, from, uh, like from your society where you grow up, maybe your gender determines what you are interested in, and that also influences your qualifications, right? Irrelevant of your true intelligence. It might be that male uh, kids are, get, get different toys, and by that, at the end, they end up with different qualifications, right? Because they played with different toys. And, Female kids, they, they play with other toys that more lead to other directions. And so, in a way, the gender could influence the qualifications. Even though overall, everything is possible, everyone could be qualified. But like if you take a society with certain rules, with certain conventions, the gender can influence the set of qualifications that you have. And now the question is, if you are like in a company and you are the person who hires other people, of course, you should look at the qualifications. And now the gender is directly possibly influencing whether you hire a person, but also indirectly via the qualifications. And of course, you want to avoid direct effects of the gender on your hiring process, but you cannot do much against indirect effects. So if you're, uh, let's say, uh, like a classical example in the engineering domain, if, if there are more male, more super excellent male applications, then it's clear that possibly you will more likely hire a male person for your position, right? And in other branches, maybe the other way around. And that is the kind of discrimination which might be acceptable, right? It doesn't have to be acceptable, so there's also affirmative action or there are other ways where you're like proactively trying to equalize gender in your company, for example. But if it's really about certain qualifications that are there or that are not there, in that case, you have no choice. And then you will end up with more males than females, possibly. And that maybe would not be considered like a, a gender discrimination. And similar things could be said also for coming from a certain race. It's typically an example in the US very often. But probably you could also make a story in Germany that there are people who have different origin. And because of that origin, they might come more from poorer families. And the poorer families have maybe less access to education or less, less educational background. Let's simply say it. Um, fewer books in the shelves, right? And so that might be a disadvantage if you're coming from a certain background. And so the question is whether you are discriminating directly where a pe person comes from, the origin, or whether it's about the qualifications. And those are two different things. And it would be nice to mathematically distinguish them and to reason about them, and ideally to estimate them from data. So in mediation analysis, that's a classical topic in social sciences, for example, and also in other areas where you have real data, you are trying to split the total effect from X to Y, so the overall effect that gender has, for example, on the hiring process, into a direct part that goes directly from X to Y, 
and some indirect paths which might go via the qualification. And if you can distinguish that, maybe you can be a slightly bit more fair in your hiring process, okay? So, of course, if we could really evaluate that, then that might have policy implications. So policy implications typically means for companies, so what are the rules with which I'm hiring, right? Or policy implications for a university might be with what rules am I admitting people? So if people want to study medicine, do I always require 1.0 Abitur or are there also exceptions sometimes because of other backgrounds or other circumstances? And so um, to mathematically describe them is the first step kind of to have more informed policy decisions at the end. However, um, as always, Many things here are more mathematical. We describe these things, trying to describe them mathematically precisely, but sometimes we cannot estimate everything. But at least it gives us a handle to ask the right questions and to see what data should we try to um, collect and what kind of randomized experiments should we do. So how should we look at the data or what, how should we look on the, on the world and what, what experiments should we do to answer these questions. So here's another example, so that's from the medical domain, taking a treatment or not. However, possibly your treatment generates headaches, okay? And then when you have a headache, you are very likely to take an aspirin because it might reduce the headache. So now if you find out that the person is cured or not, depending on the treatment, is it due to the treatment? So that would be the direct effect. Or is it due to the uh, effect that the treatment causes headache, headache causes aspirin, and aspirin causes the solution to your problem, okay? So you want to distinguish these things. Yeah, so that is, the, I think, the question that I just said. Um, here's the policy decision. Should we tell the patients to avoid using aspirin during the treatment, right? If we do that, maybe we are manipulating the data in such a way that we really can say something about the treatment, whether it's useful or not. And many other questions we could ask. Um, Let's first talk about notation, and here I'm trying to explain the notation from the paper. Um, basically, we had all these things already, but maybe not in this notation. So typically, we write things down in the more verbose way of writing. There's a probability distribution of y, for example, and we would say y is distributed according to p of y. And then here are some variations of y where we add some sub-indices, where the sub-indices are values of random variables or sometimes random variables themselves, okay? And that is a nice shorthand notation from Julia Pearl, where y sub x means that we are looking at the distribution of y where we set the value of capital X to little x. So the sub value is a little x, it's a possible value. So um, basically in the treatment situation we are interested in the random variable y being treated, so then X is being treated, or X not being treated. So those are the ones that we are interested in. And that's a very nice short notation. If we want to have a different value for X, we in this paper they call it typically X star, which is typically then another value. Um, similarly, we could also talk about other random variables and use subscript to them. So the subscript is used to de denote an intervention here, okay? And of course, if there's like noise, which is often omitted, for example, if we are already conditioned P of Y given some value for the noise, we could also view these random variables as function of this noise here, okay? And of course, um, the question, they might be random or they might not be random anymore. So it depends, right? It could be that there's a fixed value, single Y, little Y, if there's a particular choice for the noise variable u. That's often the case if the u is a noise variable for my random variable capital Y, then by fixing the u sub y, then typically I also fix the y. But that doesn't have to be the case, so it still makes sense to use a capital letter here for the function name, okay? So um, as an example, um, the counterfactual, what value y would have been if we set x to x star, yeah? Given that we observe the x being equal to f, x could be now expressed as y sub x star of u, where the u is chosen according to our distribution that is compatible with our true observations, x without the star, okay? So the y of u uh, sub x star is a very short way to talk about uh, counterfactuals. So that's why I think it's a quite handy notation. And I'm not sure whether anyone came up with a better one. So. 
So it's, it's very confusing when you see it the first time, but then when you start using it, it's getting, you get used to it. And today, basically, we have lots of these expressions, and we're trying to make sense out of them and trying to understand them. So let's start with the total effect. So the total effect is defined in this paper as the difference in value for variable y if we would have a different uh, value in x. So here and there, I don't have a particular um, graphical model in mind, but basically it says, um, what is the value, the distribution, oh, okay, what is the actual value of my random variable y given that I set variable x to x compared with setting x to x star? Okay, so that is the total effect. And as I write it here, it is a random variable itself, right? But of course, you can take the expectation and then you could say the total, uh, um, the total effect is the expected value of doing this, right? So then the randomness is kind of gone if you take the expectation. But in principle, you could also say, so here's a random variable and that one is expressing the total effect that it has. And now how do I choose x and x star? So I don't have to choose them. They are given here, right? So they are inputs to the total effects. Basically, I'm asking whether changing little x to little x star is having an effect on y, okay? So that is what I'm asking here. And of course, then I could have a ton of um, qualitative definitions around it. So this is only a quantitative definition where I'm trying to quantify the total effect, but I could say x has a total effect on y if there is a little x and an x star where basically this total effect is less than, uh, is different from zero. Okay, so if there is an x and an x star, such a te is different from zero, then I would say there is at all a total effect of x on y, right? But then this is just add-on that I can always put onto these definitions. So in the sex discrimination example, x is gender, y is a hiring, that might be the qualification, and I have two values, x star being male, x being female. And my picture of this example is that I'm now in the human resources department and I having, I'm having a big pile of applications and maybe they are sorted in two piles. One is they were accepted and we hire them and the other ones they were not accepted. Okay, so that is my data set kind of. And in principle, of course, I have an infinite distribution of applications, so they are actually probability distributions, but I could also collapse it onto finitely many samples, basically, right? So now the total effect will compare the hiring outcome yeah, of a randomly chosen male with a randomly chosen female application. So I could also sort all my applications into the male and female part, and then I could compare whether the outcome for the males is different from the females, okay? So that is like the overall total effect. However, now my application procedure is, of course, it's, it's kind of unclear, or I haven't specified it. Now the question is, is the total effect due to an indirect effect via the qualifications, which might be societal reasons, or is it due to some weird application procedure that I prefer male applicants, for example, just subjectively, and so there's a bug in the system and I have a direct effect that a company maybe doesn't want, okay? And those, those, like the, those are more subtle questions than just to calculate the total effect. So let's try to define the um, direct and indirect effect. So first there's a so-called controlled direct effect and I think, so he mentioned it in this paper but I think it's from another paper. So it, it's the first definition and just by looking at the bird's eye view, you see now the sub-indices get more interesting. Okay, now there's an additional Z included here. So what does it mean? So first of all, always have this picture in your head that there's the X arrow Y and then there's another path via the Z. And now what we are doing here, the controlled direct effect is if I fix the variable z to a particular value, yeah, so I do set the value z, what is the difference in outcome? So concretely that means I would um, sort all these applications by qualifications, let's say by the grade in the abitur, for example, and then I take all the applications, male and female, that basically um, have the same abitur grade, and then I can compare um, males and females, and that is the controlled direct effect. And I can do that for every grade, basically, right? And there are these stories about Simpson's paradox and blah, 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 which we are not talking about here. But this is called the so-called controlled direct effect, 
because I'm, I'm really measuring um, the effect that um, x has on y because the z is fixed. So my x doesn't influence the z. I'm really comparing males with the same grade as females. So we, I cannot say that the gender was influencing the grade or something because I'm really only comparing applications that have exactly the same grade. And this is also called controlling now for the qualification or controlling the variable z or controlling the backdoors. Okay, so I'm controlling those values. Okay, that is the controlled direct effect. Fine, that's something. And there's some literature from Perl where he completely characterizes when I can estimate that and when I can't, right? And basically, I guess you will be able to figure it out because it's basically the probability of y given do x comma do z. And then you could ask, so what kind of experiment do I have to do or what kind of data do I have to collect to really calculate that? Um, okay, as I said, in the sex discrimination now, we could we fix a qualification level that's choosing a ver value z and then we compare the hiring outcomes of male versus female. Okay, so that's the controlled direct effect. What about the controlled indirect effect? That unfortunately is no, there's no good way to do this because in the indirect effect, I want to go through the qualification part, but then I cannot control for it, right? So I could either control the qualification or I could measure how the z really influences the y, uh, the x influences the y via the z. But in that case, the z must freely flow, so it must freely randomly choose its value depending on the input x that I give it, whether it's x or x star, I get a different distribution for the z. Um, and there's no way kind of to control or to cut off the direct connection. So there is no way to define a controlled indirect effect, okay? However, there's something else we can do. There's a so-called natural direct and indirect effect. And those are now variations of the, uh, of the thing that we've just seen. And for those, we can do both. And they also will nicely generalized to more complicated networks. So, and that's, I think, what the main thing of the paper is. The paper is mainly about how to define these things and then whether we can calculate them and putting some theory in. And this now looks quite curious. So this using like double indexing and one is a random variable. And so let's discuss what we have here. So first of all, the direct, the natural direct effect of x on y is given by this expression. So again, it's a dif difference between two random variables here. And um, maybe to understand the expression, let's look at an example. So suppose we have the structural equation model or st structural causal model. So x is somehow directly defined. It doesn't have any parents, but it's noise variable. The z has x as a noise variable and the y depends on x and z. Fine. So that is just an equation for the graph that we had in our mind. Um, furthermore, let's call the value z star a value that we get from um, for a fixed uz and plugging in the x star, we get a z star. Okay, so they are compatible with each other. Then we could write down what the y sub x star is, and that is basically the result of um, plugging in the x star and the z star. Because just plugging in, setting the value of x to a particular value, in this case male, the x star, will generate a certain distribution of the qualifications, and that then gets plugged in. So more precisely here, the z star is a random variable. So maybe I should use here a capital Z at that point, because there's still some randomness. Yeah, is there some randomness? Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe if I have a fixed u of z, maybe it's not random anymore. So OK, the notation is a bit fishy here. The main point is, this is the expression on the right side over here, which is just the outcome if I take all applications and I check um, the, uh, the hiring rate of the male applications. Okay, so that's basically what I'm calculating here. Now, what is the other expression? The other expression plugs in for the x a different value, so for example, female, but for the qualifications, the male ones. Okay, so it's like saying, um, take all the male qualifications, uh, take all the male applications and let's fake the applications and let's change the gender of all of them, okay? Let's change the names and maybe the gender and maybe the images and then we hand it again to our human resources department and we see what we get, okay? So we are just changing um, one variable but keeping 
the random the random distributions that we would have gotten from the other one. And for that one, we can draw a nice picture yeah. on the board. So we have our graphical model. And then I said we are comparing the y um, x star with the y, where we said plug in the x. But then we also plug in a z for the x star. And that is like saying, now I having, I'm having a little value here for the x star. And that guy is going to z. And I'm having an x on this side, and that one is going to y. OK? So kind of, I'm having the graph, but this is a computer program anyway. So along this branch, I'm sending an x star. And along this branch, I'm sending an x. And then I'm sampling from the z as if I would have a male application, right? But it is a female, OK? And then this difference here gives us a so-called natural direct effect of changing x to x star. There's a question about the ordering, but I think that's, or is it changing x star to x, to it, yeah, it's one or the other way around. You see it's a non-symmetric one. The other, way, the other way around is slightly different. OK, and this is an interesting thing, because uh, you remember when we had these backdoor criteria, we were kind of controlling like the backdoors with the summation over the values. And this is also controlling backdoors in this case by passing one value to the backdoors and another one via the front door, yeah? which is, I think, quite creative. So I think this is qualitatively something we haven't seen yet. OK, so far so good. Um, and now we can also have a natural indirect effect where we just kind of permute somehow the axis here. So the last part stays the same. But in the front part, we are swapping the role of x star and zx. OK? Let's think about it, what it means on the board. OK? So let me copy, um, let me copy the expression to the board. So this is indirect and this is direct. And this is now the same expression. So everything's the same. But the star is at a different location. By the way, I think the star should go up here. Minus yx star. So now, what is that supposed to mean? That basically means um, I'm sending the x up here and the x star down here. So this, by looking at this, it looks very symmetric. But let's also draw a diagram for that one here, OK? For that one, it would be zx and y. Uh, OK, how do we write it? Uh, we should do this. So we could write it like that. So this random variable here is given by having, by sending an x star to both of them. Okay, so both get the same. In a way, this is a description of a computer program. Now, if I'm doing it like that, maybe, uh, okay, let's take first the second one. I could put it down here as well. So I directly receive the x star, and I indirectly receive the, um, the x via the z. And now the question is, um, what's the relationship between it? So what is this relationship? So this one is basically kept. So the direct thing that gets directly sent is staying the same. But I'm only changing the stuff that is going via the indirect path. Okay. So that's why comparing these two is talking about is, is having a change only in the indirect part. That's why it's called the indirect effect. And the other way around, if I would swap those roads over here, then comparing the two graphs, we see that the stuff that is passed through the uh, indirect part stays the same, and the direct part 
is changed. Okay? And you see that this is quite a fancy shortcut notation for these situations here. But I must admit, I only understand it when I draw these diagrams. Otherwise, it's too much headache here for me. Yeah? OK, so these things can be defined, which is quite interesting. Let's see. Now, first of all, why is it called natural? Yeah? So this variable z is called natural. Since we don't fix it, like in the controlled direct effect, there we are fixing it to a particular value. Um, but we let it flow very, uh, we, we let it um, be random, but it will be determined by the input that it gets. And once it gets the x, and once it gets the x star. Okay, so it's depending on the input. That's why it's called naturally. Um, and note, this is like also called deactivating the link. I think that is a phrase um, that uh, Judy Apple used in some, some talk at some conference, that this is a kind of new type of intervention, right? So we are not intervening in a way where we are setting one of the variables to a particular value, and then it just goes through the whole network. But we're doing it like at every link differently. We can pass different values through it. And this opens up a, a new box of questions that we could ask about these things, right? So we can now write the much more complicated expressions, yeah? So that saying here that the y is using directly the x star, but only indirectly the x via the z. So that is all contained in this expression. OK, in this example now, we could also interpret it. And it's getting quite advanced. So I'm more or less quoting here Pearl's paper. So this is text adapted from the paper, almost copy and paste it. So the direct effect compares the change in male hiring yeah, so the male hiring is the y sub x star. And it compares it to hiring after instructing the employees to treat males' applications as though they were females. So we are keeping the qualifications from the males' applications, but we are changing the name and the picture, and by this changing the gender. And then we could see whether um, now the rate of being higher changes or not, and that allows us to measure the direct effect okay, of gender on the hiring process. The natural indirect effect also has an interesting story. Again, we are comparing the change in male hiring yeah, with, um, with the hiring of males who are trained to acquire equal qualification as those of females, whatever that means. Um, that is more complicated in my head. I think practically it would mean um, you take the female applications, yeah, and then you change the female names to male names and change also the pictures to male pictures, and then you see whether you get a different outcome. Okay? So basically, you could calculate the probability of being hired, hired with a classical original male application and compare it with the probability of being hired if you take a female application and you turn it into a male application. And then you can compare those two effects. So that is the natural indirect effect. Okay. Curiously, from this discussion now, we come up already with some interesting experiments that companies could do to their human resources um, uh, department. So, and I think only by having this kind of um, notions to talk about, like we are able to formulate these kind of experiments possibly. OK, there's, of course, a relation between all these quantities or some of the quantities that we've seen. And the relation is as follows. So the total effect is the difference between the natural indirect effect and the natural direct effect, which is confusing. So why is it the difference, right? We would expect it to be the sum, right? However, note that the roles of x and x star are swapped here. And the, the minus sign is only there because in the NDE of x and x star, um, it's not just minus the NDE of x and x. So, OK, now let me, let me write it on the board. So the problem here is the following. In general, swapping these things does not just change the sign. Okay, this holds only 
Polynia models. So if I have a linear model, it basically means something like this, the z is equal to alpha times x, and the y is equal to beta times z plus gamma times x, something like that, plus noise, okay? That is the linear model, and if that is the case, one can show that the NDE of x and x star is the same as minus the NDE of x star and x. However, if we have nonlinear models, this doesn't hold anymore. And then everything is complicated, more complicated. Why is it so complicated? Um, the reason being because uh, we always look at the change with respect to the second argument here, and we compare it. But you could also write down now four other expressions, the NDE of x star and x, and of x star and x, and you get four more of these, uh, two more of these, okay? And for nonlinear relationships, we don't have this simple um, formula. So let's look back on the slide, what we've seen. So if we have a linear model, then we can swap x star and x, and everything is fine, and we get the summation. So the direct effect plus the indirect effect is the total effect, OK? And the other way around. Yes, please? Kein problem. <laughs> okay, so um, so the minus sign looks weird, but it's there because it also holds for nonlinear models. And in nonlinear models, the whole thing is more subtle and more complicated. Okay, so it's correct. So to see where the minus sign comes from, let's look, let's look at the proof. And the proof is really trivial in a way. We just plug in these expressions, and then we have the minus and the plus of a similar expression. So, uh, no, we have the same expression twice. So the NIE of x and x star shares the y, x star, and zx, okay? And that's why we need one, the swap one. If, if I would use the NDE of x and x star, then I wouldn't get this expression twice. I only get it twice if I swap the roles. And then if I take the difference, this complicated term just disappears and I end up with a total error, okay? And similarly, if I do it the other way around, I get everything the other way around. And here you also see, so this is the other way around, the NDE of x and x star, and so if I add it to the NIE of x and x star, yeah, then we, you see that you can't do anything because the y sub x, z x star is not the y x star z sub x. And that's only true for, I think, linear models or something, okay? So that's why it's so looking so complicated. Um, also note that, I mean, what have we done here? I mean, we are just using now, starting with a very simple graphical model with three variables, and then using the do notation in a clever way, right? And thinking about um, pushing one value through the computer program like that and pushing another one like that, and then having expressions for the different notions. So in a way, that wasn't very deep. But it looks like we get some quite interesting stuff out of it, which is kind of non-obvious. OK, um, as I said, for linear models, going from x to x star, by the way, is also proportional to the difference of these two values. OK, that's just how it is. If you take the difference of y1 minus y2, it's like the same as having something with that there will be an expression of x minus x star in there with some sign in front of it. And that's why. Um, uh, we will just have a plus sign in that case. So for the linear model, we have the relation that kind of is intuitively making sense. Okay, but in general, we want to have the, the um, same thing for nonlinear models, and we can only prove these equations up here for nonlinear mo models. Okay, so far so good. Um, I think that's already the main content of today's lecture. Um, in the following, I briefly only show you how this could be done even more general, yeah? So we can have even more general reasons, uh, reasoning here. Any questions up to here? None. Okay, maybe one, um, one note that I would like to make. 
in a way looking at the differences between two things, like we did already for the total causal effect, so where we had y minus y sub x minus y x star, that is kind of an arbitrary choice to look at the linear difference, right? We could also ask and compare the quotient. That would be another option, right? Or we could also have a dis dis distance like this, uh, x star, and we can divide by the sum of the two or some, or some other thing. So that's completely arbitrary how we compare them. That is just the simplest way, but that's not essential to the theory. So the essential thing here is that we're having, that we are having these kind of expression, and then we can somehow compare them, and that gives us some insight. However, in order to have this additivity thing with the total, um, total effect and the NDE and the NIE, for that one, of course, we need to look at the difference. Otherwise, that doesn't make sense. OK. So the last chapter or last section in the paper is about um, general path specific effects. And now this is not as fancy as it would look like when you see it the first time. So of course we could now not only ask what is the direct effect from x to y, but we can take a general graph like that one and we could ask what is the effect of x influencing z and then w and then y. So we want to have the effect that x has on y along this path. Okay? And that is a quite sophisticated question. Yeah, for example, uh, Okay, let, let me come up with a random example. Let's say we have some, um, uh, some metabolic pathways in some cells or something, and we know something about the mechanism, what is influencing what in the cell, then we could ask what is the effect via a particular pathway through the, in the cell. And I don't care for everything that is surrounded, but only one particular pathway might be interesting. Why am I interested in it? Because maybe there's a metabolic problem and there are like one step in this chain is broken and I want to evaluate how serious this is, whether it's serious or not, okay? And then I could ask a question like that with these general path specific effects calculations. Okay, now how is it implemented? Basically, now we use this notation. So we randomly sample some x or let's say we pick a value little x and we plug it in here, so we're doing a do x, and we let it go along the path. However, all the edges that we don't want to have, for that one, we are using a different x. So here we start with an x star, and we pass on here to the w, the direct connection will be via an x star, and then here we have a z star, which might be generated from the x star as well, okay? And, and by that, by comparing basically what's happening if I set the value x to a particular value and then let it go through the whole network, I can compare what's happening if I only go via along this specific path, okay? And then I, I gain some knowledge through this. So here's a little bit more detail, which I also copied from the paper. So this is the description basically of this graphical model. So it's the structural equation model. <coughs> and now to calculate the total effect along the path, for example, I'm, I'm comparing for x and x star. I, I can choose those val values arbitrarily, so I don't need the first equation. And now I'm calculating the z by using the x, so that's fine. And I'm calculating a z star by using the x star, okay? And then when I go on, for the w, I'm taking z and x star. And for the y, I'm taking z star and w, okay? Just by cleverly combining these things, I can have quite a complicated, sophisticated query here. Okay, so there's of course big question that I haven't answered is which of these quantities are identifiable from purely observational data? And um, the answer in the paper is most are not, okay? So most require some experiment. However, the do calculus will give us the answer. What experiments are we really needing? So maybe there's a particularly nice designed experiment which will answer then a very sophisticated question. And it's a mathematical way to talk about it. So the other reason why uh, formalization of these kind of things are important uh, is because then you can prove some non-identifiability results. So you can also mathematically prove 
um, it's not enough to have observational data to estimate these things, okay? However, then comes additional assumptions, like for the, um, let's say, for the additive, additive noise models that people were using for only two variables, and then suddenly you can do it with additional assumption. And something similar could happen here. But I think um, that branch of, um, of machine learning where they're trying to estimate like x is the cause of y hasn't been joined with these kind of questions here. And I think um, so far this is quite theoretical and maybe one needs some very concrete questions or some really pressing questions in commerce or in industry or something and then people might look at it. Or maybe some academic likes to solve all these problems and come up with an interesting question and people will use it in 30 years or maybe after being published. There are a couple of difficulties to, uh, to calculate these things really. So typically it's quite hard to rewrite an expression like that, some counterfactual thing. So that's, that's getting very messy. Uh, it getting, even if you have these, in particular if you have these double sub-indices, things get really, really tough. However, there might be more work to do and it might be interesting research direction to look at, but it's not as popular as deep learning right now. Of course, there's always a question, can we do all this with neural networks? That must be always the questions we should always ask and if we should do it immediately, but it's not obvious how to do it because neural networks are good at learning input-output relationships, but this is somewhat more intricate, I think. Okay. Good. So far, so good. That's it for today. It was quite short. Any questions? Not right now. Okay. So thanks for your attention.